All right, good evening. Second, uh, I mean, First Kings chapter 1. I'll get that right. First Kings chapter 1. Time to get into the book tonight. And I uh, mentioned last week, recommended reading for this week was, was 1 Kings 1 through 11, which is kind of the, the Solomon arc of the book. I mentioned last week in terms of how uh, First and Second Kings work, you've got, oh, you know, what, four going on 500 years covered in this book. Um, but what really happens is there's really only, only three or four eras that the book really focuses on. And one of the things that happens in ancient style historical writing, this is true, for instance, of this book, it's, it's true of the book of Acts, is that in some ways the earliest chapters are some of the most important and where you want to slow down and dig in a little bit like we're going to do this week and next week because they give you kind of the, the ideals of the book. They give you what should be normal or what the goal is. Acts, right? What happens in Acts chapter 2? You, in one sense, the most thorough you know, preaching of the gospel, response to the gospel establishment of the church, the church is living, because Acts 2 is the beginning of the church, right? And there's a very real sense in which, while David established the house, Solomon is, is the, well, David and Solomon are both messianic in a sense, but Solomon represents kind of the, the but this way, first and second coming of Jesus, right? First coming, he comes as a man of blood. He, only he's not the one who's doing the killing like David did in war. He's the one who is killed, um, and he does that. Um, and then he goes back to God's right hand, and when he comes back, then what comes? Well, heaven, right? The, the messianic kingdom in its fullness, right? You with me? And Solomon represents that eternal state. Solomon, whose name literally in Hebrew means peace, shalom, well-being. Um, Solomon is, is the embodiment of the messianic ideal of the kingdom of God, every man under his vine and fig tree, peace and prosperity and riches beyond imagination. That kind of a fulfillment of the messianic ideal. Does that make sense? And so Solomon, the, these chapters of Solomon are important because they represent in one sense the coming of the kingdom of God, the, the, earthly, the, 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 the earthly fulfillment of the promise not just to David but to Abraham. Uh, you know, this is again the time when the border extends all the way to the full property that was promised to Abraham from Egypt to, to Mesopotamia basically. And all the nations like we talked about last week come and they worship at the house of the Lord. The Queen of Sheba says, never Never have I found such wisdom. You know, the mountain of the house of the Lord and the law goes forth and all nations come. That, that vision that Isaiah has of the coming true messianic kingdom, Solomon is the down payment of all that. But Solomon also represents how they lose it because Solomon himself inaugurates uh, the, the uh, plants many of the seeds that the rest of the book will again trace the fallout from. So we're going to spend some time this week and next week more. Other weeks we're going to move through a whole bunch of chapters quickly um, because we have, to, we have to kind of pick and choose how we're going to do this. And again, the goal is not just to read individual stories moralistically, it's, it's the tr with, with, with immediate life application. The goal is to see the full vision of the world and how it works and our place in it the way God sees it. We're doing big picture stuff that we don't often do in our classes. So, but to do that, we again, we've got to read this. The book focuses a lot of, of time for someone who's got to get through 500 years, focuses a lot of time here at the beginning on Solomon. So we need to kind of slow down a little bit and we need to look closely at what the book shows as the ideal and what the book shows as the roots of, of the downfall that the rest of the book chases. Now that being said, remember, um, one of the things we mentioned last week is what's often missed about this book is the real stars of the book are who? Anybody remember? It's not so much the kings, it's who? The prophets. Because the prophets are the guys who show up to do what? Why do they have to show up at all? What do they got to do? Tell the people, and even more so sometimes tell who? The kings. You know, we focus on the kings as the movers and shakers, but no. The kings have to be checked as often as not. Um, and that includes Solomon. Because we'll meet one of the first prophets. We don't remember his name very often. But we'll meet one of the first prophets here late in Solomon's reign who has to show up and say, <laughs> what's, what's going on here? And so the prophets, in many ways, are the stars of the book. Most famously, these two guys named Elijah and Elisha. And they are the stars of the book. And if there's a star of the book, who's the even bigger star of the book? It's not the men. It's not the kings. It's not the house of David. Who is it? It's God. It's, it's, and it's God's patience with, with rampant covenant breaking for centuries before he finally decides to keep the other part of his word, 
not only is his word you know, a word of promise and hope and mercy and forgiveness, his word is also the certainty of judgment for sin that is not changed. And that's just as much a true word of God as the hope of mercy and grace and forgiveness. And so we've got to keep all of God in view. And, uh, and that's what this book helps us do. All right. So let's read a little bit, shall we? Chapter 1. I'm going to spend a lot of time chapters 1, 2, and 3 tonight. Chapter 1. Oh, in fact, uh, as you pull out your Bibles and look down, and I, one other thing to understand. Here's, here's the other thing as we enter into the book for the first time and start reading. Here's what you've got to understand. The way we often are used to these books, going all the way back to when we were kids and Bible classes growing up, is that often, again, these books are, you know, we kind of, we kind of smash First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings together as though it's, it's one story. And in one sense it is, but here's the thing you've got to understand the way we're going to read this book, especially if we start here in chapter 1. This book stands on its own. It assumes you know some of the material in Samuel, and we'll even see some echoes here in just a minute, but it stands on its own. It, it's, and and, and the, I was thinking about this. What's the closest analogy to kind of get this, this idea across? Okay, let's take, for lack of a better way to do it, let's take Star Wars, the Star Wars movies, because most people have seen those or are familiar with it, and, and Star Wars is one of those pop culture things that actually does this, which is this, very similar to what's going on here in the Bible with storytelling. What the Star Wars movies, there's nine of them now, right? Nine of them. I'm not talking about all the cartoons and other things and what Disney Plus is doing now and all that. No, I'm talking about the, the nine movies, right? There are nine Star Wars movies all together. And they come in groups of three. Yeah, for some of you, okay. If, if you're not a Star Wars person, hang on. But, but if I think this is going to catch a lot of us. They come in groups of three, right? They come in groups of three. Back in the, in the 70s, early 80s, you had what are now episodes four, five, and six. And then in the late 90s, early 2000s, you got episodes one, two, and three. And then tragically, Disney decided to make seven, eight, nine. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, but, the, but, but, but you get seven, eight, nine. Now, here's the thing. With each of those trilogies, well, okay, I can change that. With the second and third trilogies, because the first started it. With the second and third trilogies, does it start immediately in the same time? No, you're, you're, you're jumping around different eras. You're like, like, you know, once the prequels go back 30 years from the original trilogy, the, the latest ones go about 30 years or so down the road from the original trilogy, give or take. Some of you diehards, I got it wrong, I'm sorry. But we get the point. You know, there, 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 there's, there's time gaps between these movies. And here's the other thing. But do the movies assume that you know the, the universe, the world, if you will? Yeah. Yeah, once you get with both the prequels and then with the, and then with the, the 7, 8, 9, the, Dis, the Disney ones here most recently, they assume you know kind of the underneath world. And not just individual stories, but, but the concepts, the world, right? This, this, sometimes called the Star Wars universe. It's, it's a whole mythology you can enter into. They assume you know that. But each movie, in one sense, is meant to be standalone. You can watch it, right? You with me? Okay, so, so that's kind of the idea here. These books are going to assume you know some of these old stories, but the book itself is meant to stand alone. So we're going to start here in chapter one, and it's David as an old man. But here's the thing. Um, this is meant to kind of take a picture of David that maybe we're not as used to from reading First and Second Samuel. The book wants to, because with the books, again, why was this book written, we mentioned last week? The epilogue gives a hint, because it puts the, the books dating very precisely in the 560s. Why was First and Second Kings written, most likely? Remember we talked about this last week. At the very end of the book, the hint's given. Well, yeah, how do you lose a kingdom, and how do you still have hope in, you know, with this whole God promised David he never lack a man to reign on the throne? Because remember, what, what's that weird little, little epilogue? We talked about, again, movie analogy last week. The credits roll, and sometimes with a movie, there's a little teaser, you know, somewhere stuck in the credits, either, either during the credits or the end of the credits, that says, oh, wait a second, the movie wasn't quite over after all, or there's this one other thing we want you to leave the theater with. And in this case, it was Jehoiakim lives, and when Nebuchadnezzar died, he was elevated up to the Babylonian king's table. He's going, he's going to survive, and that means the line of David survives, right? And so in the midst of how I've lost this kingdom, absolutely, was God fair in what he allowed to happen to us and what he did to us? Yes, that's part of what the book's about. God was just. You know, because what, then like now, what's human nature when bad stuff happens? We want to blame we want to blame God. We're the people of God. Why would God let this happen to me? No, you're more sinful than you realize sometimes, especially collectively. We talk about individual lives, but collectively, you're a wicked people. But we always want to self-justify ourselves, don't we? So the book's meant to open your eyes. You're sitting there in exile. This is how you got here. Don't whitewash it. 
this is how we got here. However, there's still that little line of hope. But if, so, but if the theme of the book, in one sense then, is to justify God's allowing Babylon to destroy Jerusalem, to wipe out the temple, um, to seemingly dis, you know, end the dynasty of David, why would God let that happen? This is why. And what's interesting about it, what the book wants us to see, is that in some ways, the roots of this go back even before Solomon to who himself? David. David. I mean, at once it's most famously Solomon is known for his many women, but who, who was the first king to majorly collect women? Here's the hint. It wasn't Saul. Who did that? David did. And that sin with David and Bathsheba, ironically, who was Solomon's mother? Bathsheba. So we're in the, not the Star Wars universe now, we're in the Old Testament universe. It assumes you know some of this stuff, but it wants to start with a particular angle. And it starts with David as an old man. Solomon's about to get it. And while there's some real potential, some real possibilities, there's some tastes of messianic kingdom here of what God intends for the family of Abraham to enjoy. Already here in chapter one, David, old man David, we get some hints of, feet of clay from the very founder of the dynasty himself. Not just because of the Bathsheba episode, but the Bathsheba episode reveals even some flaws in David. He may be a man after God's own heart, but David himself has flaws. And part of the message is, is, is actually that we need to learn to find no hope in mere man, even David himself. Where's our hope ultimately got to go back to? And that's, what, that's the great power of how David, or God rather will actually keep his promise to David because God himself will become a son of David. And God will, in that form, become, in Jesus of Nazareth, the king who fulfills the promises of the house of David perfectly, the true son of David who can reign with true righteousness, true wisdom, true justice. You need God to become one of us to solve this problem that this book depicts, which is even David himself, technically, actually starts sowing the seeds of the downfall of his own house, his own kingdom. Chapter 1. So King David was old and advanced in years, and although they covered him with clothes, he could not get warm. Therefore his servants said to him, Let a young woman be sought for my lord the king, and let her wait on the king and be in his service. And let her lie in your arms, or in the Hebrew more particularly, your, your bosom, a little bit of a, of a sexual innuendo there, she's available. Let her lie in your bosom or in your arms, that my lord the king may be warm. And so they sought for a beautiful young woman. Now remember, Hebrew narrative is usually very sparse on details. Hebrew actually has very few adjectives. It's not a language given to adjectives. When adjectives show up in Hebrew storytelling, you need to notice. Why would he tell you that this woman is beautiful? Why? What are we meant to think or, or, or expect or wonder about? You're putting a beautiful young woman in an old king's bed, ostensibly to keep him warm. Well, they found Abishag the Shunammite, brought her to the king. The young woman was very beautiful. Second time we're told that in a very short space. You're meant to notice it. She was very beautiful, and she was of service to the king and attended to him, but the king knew her not. In other words, after giving us this expectation, you put a beautiful young woman in the king's bed, what do you expect is going to happen? He's going to, she, you know, he, they're going to, to do that. But that's what the text has to basically subvert the expectation and say, but he knew her not. So when you start with, let's find a beautiful young woman for the king, what does that even remind you of? Well, that reminds you of David and Bathsheba. She was, you know, the text emphasizes she was very beautiful. He looked and so on and so forth. Only now, and by the way, and that's the sin that shatters his kingdom, right? Because when you go back and you read Samuel, that's the beginning of the end for David as a king. Um, he, is, he fails as a king from that point forward. Chapter 13, Amnon rapes Tamar. What does David do about it? Nothing. Chapter 14, um, Absalom kills Amnon in response. What does David do about it? Nothing. Chapter 15, Absalom comes back from exile and rebels and tries to overthrow. What does David do about it? He runs, and that's, that, that, but that's, exactly, that's the point. He doesn't fight for his throne, doesn't say God gave me a covenant. He runs. What, what's the pattern here we're noticing? What does David do about anything? Now, he ignores, he does nothing. And Kings wants us to see David at the end as an, literally an impotent old man at the end of his reign, who coming out of that same, we're meant to go, echoes of putting a beautiful woman in bed who's not a formerly your wife, because has she ever called his wife? 
No, it's just put a young woman, a beautiful, beautiful young woman in his bed. And he knew her not. He's impotent. And that's meant to be a symbol of how David ends his reign, not with a bang back in the days of David and Goliath and David killing Philistines. It ends with a whimper. And, and that language of knowing not is one of the, the, it's not so much a pun, but it's a theme through this chapter of what David knows and doesn't know anymore. Keep reading. So Adonijah, son of Hagith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. Now, wait a second, I've seen this story before. A son of David says, I'm going to be king. Where have I seen that story before? Absalom. Well, what's David going to do about it this time? And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen, had 50 men to run before him. His father had never at any time displeased him by asking, why have you done thus and so? And so what does verse 6 tell us about David here now? The text wants us explicitly to know this about David. What does he do about this? And not only does he do nothing about it, but the text, again, the Hebrew storytelling is very sparse, very tight. Wonder why every word is here. It doesn't just indicate he did nothing, but it also says he did not want to or he did not what? Did correct him, restrain him, displease him. Well, here's parenting 101, folks. If you never make your kids mad, you're not doing it right. If you never confront your kids for their wrongdoing and they get mad at you, you're not doing it right. Now, I'm going to talk about there's a place for tact and wisdom and so forth. But what does David do from Bathsheba all the way on in the rest of his life? He constantly avoids being a father. And because he can't be a father, he also can't be a king. Because what was Absalom's, go back to the same, what was Absalom's great complaint about David? as he rebelled against them. Why, what was the public justification Absalom gives for why I should be on the throne and not David, my father? Oh, that I were king because I would give you justice. I would do it right. And by the way, was Absalom somewhat legitimate in that complaint about David's reign at that point? You betcha he was. David was not being a father, and, and therefore David was not being a king. Which, by the way, going back to the Bible's big picture principles, that's part of why... Um, because the king was seen in, in the other languages in the Old Testament, seen as a shepherd of, of God's people, um, you know, and, and seen as the one who was not just supposed to rule. He was the one who was supposed to enforce God's law, which means bring judgment, drop the hammer when you have to. Remember, what was the refrain right before monarchy began at the end of the book of Judges? In those days in Israel, there was no king, and so what happened? Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And so what was the ultimate solution? Well, we gave you a king like all the nations. That's what you said you wanted. That didn't work out. I'm going to give you a man after my own heart, David. And the idea is he will enforce my law. He won't make up his own laws. It's not just him to do whatever he wants with his power. Why is he the king? He's un and that was, by the way, that's what separated David from Saul, really, when you go back and you read the stories in Samuel carefully. David knew that it was not his kingdom. What does David do the very first thing when he takes Jerusalem? What's the first thing David does? Build himself a palace? No, what's he do? brings the ark to Jerusalem. What's David saying? I'm not king, who's king? God is king. David, under, in the way Saul never did. When Saul loses the kingdom of 1, Kings chapter, or 1 Samuel chapter 15, Saul berates Samuel with, come and honor me before my people. Who did Saul think was the real king? He was. David sins, but the thing that separates and makes David the man after God's own heart is even in David's fallenness, David never lost sight of really where he was in the pecking order. He may do some horrible things that destroy his family and ruin his ability to rule, but David never forgot his place. Make sense? But unfortunately, that being so, just like in the Bible, James chapter 3, you know, let not many of you be teachers, for you'll receive the greater condemnation. Same thing, when you're given a role, a public role, there's, there's a burden of responsibility. Your failures aren't just then going to be your personal failures. Who are they going to affect? The higher office you hold. They're going to affect everybody. And so here's David, whose personal failures as a father therefore become his failures as a king. And that's going to hurt the, the, the nation as a whole. That makes sense? Which, by the way, that's just a standard pattern in the Bible. That at the end of the day, it's not just about having power or having the wisdom or knowledge to use it. It's about who you are. That's why in the New Testament, for instance, what's one of the most basic qualifications for elders besides having good character in and of themselves? What do we look at? We look at their homes. If you can shepherd your children well, the idea is then you can shepherd God's people well. Make sense? That's how it works. 
And that's what this story starts with, this deep assumption in the Bible that fatherhood is mentoring for, for shepherding more of God's people. But David, David's not doing it anymore. And so his father never at any time displeased him, asking, why have you done this? And so he was also a very handsome man, and he was born next after, oh, and there's the name. He was born next after who? Absalom. Why would Adonijah want to be king besides the obvious just, you know, guys want power? Because most likely, is Absalom alive or dead at this point? So who's the next son up in the birth order? It's not Solomon. It's Adonijah. The problem is, and you know this from the Old Testament universe, David has already made a covenant that who will be king after him? Solomon. And so we have this same old story like we've seen elsewhere again in the Old Testament where the younger is preferred over the older. And how well does the older take it when that happens? How well did Esau take it with Jacob? Not so well. How well did the brothers take it with Joseph? <laughs> Absolutely not well. To the point of murderous, literally, in fact, the Joseph murderous rage at him or, or, or consideration of murder. Certainly Esau, the text says at one point in the story, Esau was mad if he, he wanted to kill Jacob. Yeah, young, you know, the olders don't take it well when they are passed over in favor of the younger, even if it's God's choice. And so here's Adonijah laying claim to the throne. He was a handsome man. How was Absalom described? Good looking man. Could have been a hair model. Good looking. And again, why does the story tell us that? Why are these kind of details given? Because these are the kinds of things that worldly people base their right to rule on and their claim to fame. Not Remember, when David's chosen to be king, his other brothers were far more physically impressive, even to the point that Solomon or uh, Samuel thought. I, you know, surely these are the Lord's, you know, the Lord's chosen ones. But it was scrawny little David who, as Samuel had to be reminded, God doesn't judge by what you and I think qualifies, how we look, how impressive the resume is. What's God looking for? The heart. All right. So, uh, this handsome, very handsome man, born next after Absalom. And so, we're, again, we're already kind of, well, I've seen this story before. I've read this story before. How's it going to end this time? Well, he conferred with Joab, son of Zariah, and Abiathar, the priest. Why would he do that? Why would he do that? Legitimacy. Who's Joab? Yeah. If you're going to stage a coup, or at least make sure when the transition comes, I'm the next man up, you've got to get the generals on board. And who else in Israel do you have to get on board? The priest. That's who Abiathar is. And these are some of his dad's oldest helpers, enablers, workers. And so he's very, he knows what he's doing, and he gets these guys on board, um, Joab and Abiathar. And they followed Adonijah, and they helped him. But on the side, you had Zadok the priest, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada. Who's Benaiah? Anybody remember who Benaiah is? One of the mighty men. Remember, David's got his special forces, right? The mighty men. Um, among whom, uh, tragically, was Uriah himself, whom David began. Uriah was not just a random soldier, folks. Uriah was one of David's elites, personally known to the king in one sense. That's why when, you know, whose wife is this, they say Uriah the Hittite. That's why David should have stopped it. This wasn't just some random soldier. He knows Uriah. He's one of the elites, one of the mighty men. And so who's left out? Zadok, Benai. Why would you leave the mighty men out? Because they're most likely the most loyal to who? David. And so you leave out Zadok, you leave out Benaiah, and who else do you leave out? Nathan. You leave out Nathan. Remember, who's their stars of the books? The prophets. Who, importantly, does Adonijah not have on his side? The prophet. It's not going to go well for him then. And, and David's mighty men were not with Adonijah. So verse 9, Adonijah sacrificed sheep, oxen, fatted cattle by the serpent stone. Or, depending on your older translation, most literally from Hebrew, the stone of slithering. But in the Bible, is it generally good to be associated with a serpent or slithering? The correct answer is no. But that's where he goes, and he offers, and he offers all these sacrifices. Um, and he invited all his brothers, the king's sons, and all the royal officials of Judah, but he did not invite Nathan or Benaiah or the mighty men, or most notably Solomon. And again, details matter. His brother, underscore the treachery and underhandedness a little bit more. 
So Nathan says, the Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, again, make sure you connect all the dots here. Have you not heard that Adonai, just son of Hagith, has become king, and David our Lord does not, oh, and there's that word again, does not know it. Does not know it. Um, in what sense has Adonijah become king? Is he literally staging a coup on the same level as Absalom? No, because he knows David's going to be soon enough, dead soon enough. Don't have to take that risk. So in what sense has he become king and David doesn't know? Does David literally not know anything? No, I don't think that's necessarily the case. David's not taking it seriously because, because the whole idea is in what sense has Adonijah become king? Not literally, but what's he done? He set himself up to take over by default. You can, David can, can say whoever he wants, but who's actually done the legwork to put all the blocks in place so that as soon as David's dead, he gets the job? I got the army on my side. Um, you know, I've, I've, got the, I've, got, I've got an important priest on my side. Yeah. All right. And so Nathan says to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, have you not heard Adonai, just son of Hagith, has become king, and David our Lord does not know. He's not doing anything about it. Now, therefore, come, let me give you advice that you may save your own life and the life of your son Solomon. Because what do you think is going to happen to you if Adonijah becomes king? Go in at once to King David and say to him, Did you not, my lord, the king, swear to your servant Solomon, saying, your, uh, uh, Excuse me, I'll get it right in a sec. Did you not, uh, my lord, the king, swear to your servant, i.e. her, saying, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me and he shall sit on my throne? Why then is Adonijah king? Just like in the stories in Samuel when the only way anything actually happened between David and Absalom was for the wise woman of Tekoa to come in, once again, a woman has to come into David and tell him to do his job. Bad things happen in the Bible. This is not misogyny. This just doesn't strike a modern femini, you know, with, with feminism us very well. In the Bible, the picture is this. If a woman has to tell the man who holds the role or the office what he ought to be doing, you're already in big trouble. Sometimes people say, well, you know, women preachers are okay today because, you know, women were prophets in the Bible. Yeah, that happens occasionally, but let's take the two classic examples, Deborah and Huldah. Deborah told who to actually go out and deal with the Canaanites? Deborah told Barak. And what did Barak do? Yeah, and, and she says, okay, but the woman gets the credit. In other words, you're, you're going to be marked as a man who didn't do his job. Hulda, another great example. We're, we're modern feminists who say, you know, it's, you know women could be preachers and, and everything else. Hulda, sure, but here's the point. Hulda is prophetess when? In whose, in whose days? Josiah's days. And what was the whole point of, Jos of that stage of Josiah's reign? How bad was it? They had lost the book of the law of God, and it had just been rediscovered. That's how bad it was. They had literally forgotten the law of God completely so that all God could do was turn to, because women are the ones who always hang in there when the men fail. That's, that's the other story in the Bible, right? Who's Timothy raised by? Who's Timothy's faith really come from? Lois and Eunice. Because when all else fails, God knows he can count on the women. <laughs> But when women show up doing these things, it's because men have failed in their God-given work that badly. It's not a mark that God's okay with this, and therefore we should just be okay with it today. It's a mark of men's failure to be men. And so once again, David has to be challenged by a woman to do his job. And so Nathan sends Bathsheba in. Um, then while you are, and Nathan finishes the plan, verse 14, then while you are also still speaking with the king, I will also come in after you and confirm your words. So Bathsheba went to the king in his chamber. Now the king was very old, and Abishag the Shunammite was attending to the king. Bathsheba bowed and paid homage to the king, and the king said, what do you desire? She said to him, my lord, you swore to your servant by Yahweh your God, saying, Solomon, your son shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne. And now behold, Adonijah is king, although you, my lord, do not know it. Oh, there's that word again. You're not paying attention, David. You're not plugged in. You're not, you're, you don't get it. He has sacrificed oxen, fattened cattle, sheep in abundance, and has invited all the sons of the king of Biath, all the priests, Joab, the commander of your army. But Solomon, your servant, has not invited. David, come on. You know what this means. Come on. And now, my lord, the king, the eyes of all Israel are on you. You are the king. Do something. Act like it. You're the king. Tell them who shall sit on the throne of my lord, the king, after him. Otherwise, it shall come to pass when my lord, the king, sleeps with his fathers, that I and my son Solomon will be counted as offenders. In other words, will be seen as the problem, and that will be the end of Bathsheba and Solomon. David, you're the, still the king. Act like it. 
While she was still speaking with the king, Nathan the prophet came in, and they told the king, Here is Nathan the prophet. And when he came in before the king, he bowed before the king with his face to the ground. And Nathan said, My lord, the king, have you said, Adonijah shall reign after me instead of sit on my throne? Did you actually agree to this, David? Because this is what it looks like out there, because everybody sees what's happening, and you are doing nothing about it. For he has gone down this day, he has sacrificed ox and fattened cattle, sheep in abundance, has divided all the king's sons, commanders of the army, and the Biathar the priest. And behold, they are coming and eating and drinking before him and saying, Long live King Adonijah. Well, that's pretty clear as day. And by the way, the power of eating and drinking together in the world, uh, in the ancient world, you make covenants, you make alliances, you make agreements between people. How? What seals the deal? The fellowship meal, the common meal. By the way, that's the origin of the wedding reception. Two people come together. Two families come together. They give their son and their daughter together. They, they make a covenant together. They become husband and wife. And then what do we do to consummate it? We, we drink together. That's where that tradition came from. That's what that is. That, it's literally the, the, the memory of the old ways of how this was done. Um, same thing when, when the Sinai covenant was made. When, when Moses and God make the, 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 and Israel make the Sinai covenant. Exodus chapter 24, after Israel agrees to the covenant, what happens? Moses, and along with 70 of the elders of the people, do what? They go up on Sinai and God hosts a feast there. They eat and they drink at God's table. Why? Because we've just made a covenant. What does Jesus do just before he dies? He gives us a meal that symbolizes our fellowship with him and with each other. So here's Adonijah throwing a big feast down by the river, and what's the whole idea? You eat with me what? You're on team Adonijah. And again, David's doing nothing about this. But me, verse 26, your servant, and Zadok the priest, and Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, and your servant Solomon, he is not invited. David, you, you, you get what he's doing here, man? Has this thing been brought about by my lord the king, and you have not told your servants who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him? Ah, so finally David springs into action. Verse 28. So King David answered. And notice the, the word. It's not David. It's, again, the story's told tightly. It's who? King David. What's happening now? For the first time in the story, he's beginning to act like it. So King David answered, call Bathsheba to me. And so she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king swore to her, saying, as Yahweh lives, who has redeemed my soul out of every adversity, as I swore to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, saying, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne in my place. Even so will I do this day. And Bathsheba bowed with her face to the ground, paid homage to the king, and said, may my Lord, King David, live forever. Oh, there's that repetition again. What's happened now? Now there's the guy I married. There's a guy acting like a king finally. He's going to do something about this because that's what every man's role is in whatever kingdom God's given them, whether you're a husband, whether you're a father, or whether you're the king of Israel. God wants men to act like men with the responsibility he's given them. And now he's King David. And so he springs into action. So verse 32, David said, I'm sorry, King David said rather. Notice, I mean, again, now it's every time. What is it? King David, King David, King David. He's acting like it. He's active again. He's not this impotent old man who can't even make love to a beautiful young woman in his bed. He's just done. He's not impotent anymore. King David said, call to me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah son of Jehoiada. And so they came before the king, and the king said to them, take with you the servants of your Lord to have Solomon and my son ride on my own mule. Because what's, what's that Anijah been doing besides throwing feasts? He's been driving around in a chariot with horses and 50 men running around. What's he been looking like? He's been looking like a king. So what, what's, Saul, what's David got to do? He's got to up it. Have him right on my own mount. Was that, what, what kind of message is that going to send? Yeah, this is, yeah, this is David's guy. This is David's guy. He's going to ride on my horse, my mule. So take some of my son, ride on my own mule, and bring him down to Gihon. And that's important. Gihon was the source of the water of Jerusalem. It was the source, therefore, of the life of the city. Take him down to the source of our life, and that's where you're going to publicly proclaim him. And so let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet there anoint him king over Israel and blow the trumpet and say, Long live King Solomon. And you shall then come up after him, and he shall come and sit on my throne, for he shall be king in my place. That's the one thing Adonijah can't do yet is choose who actually gets to sit on the throne in the palace. Who can give that seat away? David can. Then bring Solomon back up put him in my seat in the palace and let everybody see who's going to be the next king. Um, 
And you shall then come up after him and shall come sit on my throne, for he shall be king of my place. And I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. And that's the, king, that, that's the key thing, too, is there was always this natural north-south rift. That's another story for another day. Time's already getting way too far, and we've gone not far enough. But there's always been this natural rift between Israel and Judah that goes all the way back to when, when, when Saul died. Did all the tribes immediately come over to David? The correct answer is no. He was king for seven years in Hebron, not Jerusalem, down in Judah deep in Judah territory, because a son of Saul tried to reign for a while until Abner brought the rest of the tribes over to David. It took almost seven years, better part of seven years, for actually David to get all 12 tribes under his reign. There was always this natural rift between north and south that we're going to see split back open later in this book in what we call the divided kingdom. But David says, ah, uh-uh, Israel and Judah, north and south, all going to come under him. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, answered the king and said, Amen. May may Yahweh, the God of my Lord, the king, say so. As Yahweh has been with my Lord, the king, even so may he be with Solomon and make his throne greater than the throne of my Lord, King David. And by the way, that's exactly what's going to happen. In a very real sense, Solomon's throne, at least for a time until Solomon loses his way, will actually surpass David's kingdom and David's greatness. Nobody from the rest of the nations came and asked David, you know, how to do things. All the nations start coming to Solomon it's Solomon who really does surpass. He is the, if, if, if David is the first coming of Jesus, Solomon is the second coming of Jesus when the full messianic greatness is seen and shown and enjoyed. All right, and so Zadok the priest, verse 38, Nathan the prophet, Benoiah, uh, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, the, and the Carathites and the Pelethites, other, other groups that were known to be loyal to David, went down and had Solomon ride on King David's mule and brought him to Gihon. And there Zadok the priest took the horn of anointing uh, from the temple, anointed Solomon. They blew the trumpet, and all the people said, Long live King Solomon. And all the people went up after him, playing on pipes, rejoicing with great joy. So the earth was split by their noise. And that's important because verse 40, who, all, who gets the message? All the people. Now watch what happens. Here's how power politics works sometimes if you want to play the game of power and and allegiances and loyalties rather than following the will of God. Here's how power politics backfires on you. So verse 41, when Adonijah and all the guests who were with him heard it it, heard it as they finished feasting. And when Joab heard the sound of the trumpet, he said, what does this uproar in this city mean? And while he was still speaking, behold, Jonathan, son of Abiathar, the priest came and said, uh, K, uh, I'm sorry, Jonathan, son of Abiathar, the priest, came, and Adonijah said, Come in, for you are a worthy man and bring good news. Oops. And Jonathan, son of Adonijah, said, No, for our Lord, King David, has made Solomon king. You thought David was too impotent to do anything about this anymore. You thought he's just lying there in bed, old and waiting to die. David found his footing again, and David has spoken, and now where does that put us? Yeah, well, worse than out in the cold, actually. (laughs) In a real lot of trouble. Because what has he done? He's basically usurped his father. And even in Jerusalem, just like through most of human history with monarchies, with monarchy, politics is a zero-sum game. Yeah, they begin to realize we're we're in trouble. Um. Verse 44, and the king has sent with him Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah son of Jehoiada, and the Carathites and the Pelethites, and they had him ride on the king's mule. Do you guys know what this means? And Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet have anointed him king at Gihon. The place matters, again, the source of life in Jerusalem. It's their spring. It's their water source. And they have gone up from there rejoicing that the city is in an uproar. Everybody's celebrating. That's the noise you've heard. Solomon sits on the royal throne. More of the king's servants came to congratulate our Lord King David and say, may your God make the name of Solomon more famous than yours and make his throne greater than your throne. And the king bowed himself on the bed. And the king also said, blessed be Yahweh, God of Israel, who has granted someone to sit on my throne this day, my own eyes seeing it. Then all the guests of Adonijah trembled and rose. And here's how power politics works when you play this game. And they all went each his own way. Everybody goes back to his house and acts like he's been there all night. Nothing to see here. We weren't at Adonijah's party. No, 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 no. We weren't there. So where's, that? So where's Adonijah's allies now? He got nobody. He's got nobody. And Adonijah feared Solomon. And so he arose and he took hold of the horns of the altar. What's the significance of doing that in that world? Sanctuary. 
theory that was a place someone could go for sanctuary. And, and literally altars, you know, we, I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of an actual proper ancient altar, but what they call horns, they kind of use these kind of bent, sharp corners, and you could go and hang on there. And it's kind of like the ancient version of a filibuster or attempt to get sanctuary. You know, once somebody's holding on to the horns of the altar, in theory, they're untouchable. Why does that Elijah do that? Because he knows he's in huge trouble now because he has usurped David, and David's acting like a king again. And then it was told to Solomon. Behold, Adonijah fears, oh, and look at this word, Adonijah fears King Solomon. For behold, he has laid hold of the horns of the altar, saying, let King Solomon swear to me first that he will not put his servant to death with the sword. And Solomon said, if he will show himself a worthy man, not one of his hairs shall fall to the earth, but if wickedness is found in him, he shall die. Let me see what he's really about first. Can I trust him? Is this the end of the matter? Or is he going to be this constant schemer working to undermine me and usurp me during my reign? So King Solomon sent, and they brought him down from the altar. And he came and he paid homage to King Solomon. And Solomon said to him, go to your house. And so now who's acting like a king? Solomon is. What's Solomon's first thing he's got to do? He's got to, he's got to figure out how to do justice in this situation. What are the kings supposed to do? They're supposed to handle the justice issues. And what does Solomon do? He makes a, he makes a declaration and he, and he makes a decision. Which brings us to chapter 2. Boy, we're, we're tight on time. It brings us to chapter 2. And this chapter works in this way. Verses 1 through 11 are kind of a section, and then the rest of the chapter, verses 12 or, uh, yeah, 12 or so through the end. Verses 1 through 11 are David's farewell speech. When David's time drew near to die. He commanded Solomon his son, saying, and again, by the way, you see great men of the Bible do this. Jacob does this before he dies with his sons, right? And Moses does this to Israel before he dies. This is what great men do. Joshua does this before he dies, brings all Israel and gives them a speech. This is what the great men of the Bible do. And so Solomon brings Solomon near to give him the speech. I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man. That kind of echoes, again, a famous farewell speech. Who does that echo? Joshua, be strong and courageous. And by the way, uh, it's what Moses said to Joshua, both in Joshua chapter 1, but also back in the late chapters of Deuteronomy. Uh, Joshua gets two pep talks, one at the end of Deuteronomy, then the one that we most famously remember in chapter 1. But in both of those speeches, Moses says to him, as kind of the, the, the highlight, the theme, be strong and courageous. Here, David, similarly, be strong and show yourself a man. Manhood is seen in the Bible's eyes by men fulfilling the male roles that God has given them. How is Solomon going to show himself to be a man? By the kind of father he is, by the kind of husband he is, and by the kind of king he is. And unfortunately, therefore, what are we going to see as the chapters go by? What kind of husband is he? Well, let's go, yeah, the, the, yeah there's a thousand opinions on that. What, and, and what kind of father is he? Well, the text doesn't deal with that as much explicitly, but sometimes the way the Bible works is it doesn't tell you, it shows you. What kind of king is Rehoboam? Is he a wise king or is he a foolish king? Cocky young man. He's a cocky young man. Um, what kind of king is Solomon? Yeah, so, but, but let's talk about, in the Bible, it matters not how you start. In the Bible, it matters with how you end. And so if, we, if that's the standard in the Bible, right, let not the one who starts the race, you know, or let the one who puts on his armor boast like the one who takes it off. I mean, just always in the Bible. It's not who starts, it's who finishes the race. And then by that standard, what kind of king is Solomon? He's a failure. And he lays the seeds again. He takes David's failures a step further and deeper and darker. All right, so... Show yourself a man. Fulfill the male roles God has given you. Husband, father, king. That's your job. That's how you show yourself a man. Uh, and by the way, it takes a lot of strength to do that. Being a husband is hard work. Being a father is hard work. Being a king is hard work. Um, this life was not made for our, our ease. This life was made as a testing, trial, and proving ground where we earn our manhood and our womanhood by struggling to fulfill the roles and the works God has given us as men and women. It's not meant to be a vacation. That's the problem with being an American Christian. It's been too easy for far too long. 
We're called to be the men and women we were created to be by fulfilling the roles God gave us to be. Keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways, keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, so that you may prosper in all that you do wherever you turn, and that Yahweh may establish his word that he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons pay close attention to their way, to walk before me in faithfulness and with all their heart, with all their soul. Oh, there's an echo of Deuteronomy. Um, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Now, this word that's used here in verse 3, that you will, again, depends on your, on your translation, walking his ways, keeping the statutes, so on and so forth, as written law of Moses, that you may, in the verse 3, ESV says prosper. Some of your translations may say succeed. But what's fascinating is in, in the Hebrew, this is the same word that is used of the tree of knowledge of good and evil that is desirable to make one wise. Now, so in other words, what's wise is what helps you to succeed or prosper, helps you to do your work well. And so here's what's important. David offers Solomon the way to have what God wants us to have in the realm of wisdom and right living and how to be the kind of husband, father, and king you're supposed to be. And it's not by taking fruit you were forbidden from. In other words, taking it on our own terms. How does David tell Solomon you're going to find the knowledge of good and evil? You're going to find the wisdom that leads you to success or, 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 or what have you. How do you do it? What's David's words to Solomon? How are you going to do that? By following God. In other words, it's not something you take. It's something that God gives. And in the Old Testament, this is again, big theme, we don't have time to chase it, but in the Old Testament, one of the subtle themes is that Torah is a tree of life and a tree of knowledge of good and, uh, it's the way of wisdom of knowing good and evil because in the law, God tells you what's right and what's wrong. God tells you what's good and what's evil. You're not left on your own to find it. Again, go back to the refrain in Judges before kings came along. There was no king in Israel. Every man did what was the chaos of trying to figure out good and evil on our own. And David says to Solomon, words that echo Genesis 3, in God's law, my son, you will find this tree. God has given it to us, but you have to find it where God said, this is what I want you to know, take and eat. Yeah. Agreed. 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 And the clock's going to catch us tonight because I managed the clock poorly, so we'll, we'll have to uh, trail in a little bit. Chapter 3 further ties in this. There is an echo of creation. Again, the Messianic kingdom, again, big Bible themes here. We're talking about big picture. Big Bible themes. The Messianic kingdom is in one sense a reset of Eden plus. It's Eden 2.0. That's why, again, in, in the book of Revelation 21 and 22, it's a city, but it's a city that looks like what? Eden, streets of gold, river that flows through it. What's there? The tree of life is there, and, and, and that's where you meet God, just like Eden. It's meant to have echoes of Eden, but be something more than even what Eden was. The Messianic kingdom is Eden 2.0. And so here, again, if Solomon is the coming of that Messianic fullness, you know, he and, you know, he and his father split the two comings of Jesus, as it were, the two sides of Jesus' Messianic work. David is the man of blood who wages war to make it happen. And then Solomon is the king who rules over the peaceful prosperity of the full kingdom of God. We're meant to see some Eden echoes here. And yes, again, that's, that's the heartbreaking thing of this, is Solomon strikes a lot of the right Edenic chords early, including, because even look at what he says when you go back to chapter 3, go back and read it again more closely this week. What is, in fact, we'll just take a time. Chapter 3, flip the page. Look at what he says when God comes to him. When God comes to him, um, verse, uh, verse 5, ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, you have shown great and, and steadfast love, chesed, that great covenantal word, to your servant, David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, righteousness, uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to send on the throne this day. And now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father, though I am a little child and I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. See, what's he doing? He's taking himself back to, I am the fulfillment of, I get, you are fulfilling the word not just to David, but to Abraham. I get what you're up to here, God, and I'm in way over my head if I'm the custodian of all this for you. I'm in way over my head. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind. Literally in Hebrew, a listening heart. We'll touch on that next week. Most modern translations don't actually bring over. He says, give me a listening heart 
Um, and then, um, the, uh, where am I at? I lost my place. Verse, uh, verse nine, yeah. Give yourself therefore an understanding mind, literally a listening heart, to govern your people that I may discern between good and evil. He gets it. He understands, and he understands this is not forbidden fruit to be taken on your own terms. Where do I have to go to find out what I'm supposed to know about good and evil? I'm supposed to go back to God. He's following his daddy's instructions on this one. But notice the connection. He asked to be able to discern good and evil, and what does God give him? What's the word for what God gave him? God gave him wisdom. Because in the Bible, wisdom is not just cleverness. Wisdom is actually having the mind of God to see the world the way God sees it. It means you understand what good and evil is. If the essence of good and evil, and, and, and remember back in Genesis when God's creating, everything is, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, it creates. In other words, the essence of good and evil is to know where everything goes, what box everything goes in, to see the world the way God does and know what box it's supposed to go in. Our kids sometimes, you know, uh, you teach your kids where their toys go, right? They don't know at first. The room is chaos. It's a mess. And you as a parent teach them, your toys go in this box, your clothes go in this drawer, right? You teach them. And they learn to see your organization of their bedroom when they're little, right? And that's what it means to discern good and evil. Not to try to figure it out on your own or make your own categories like we do in the world today, where we call evil good and good evil. Instead, you learn to see the world the way God, that's wisdom. And, and that's why in the Bible, in the Old Testament, there's an inter, intimate connection between Torah and wisdom. The law of God. If you think about Psalm 119, your word makes me wiser than all, your law makes me wiser than all, your, all my teachers, et cetera, et cetera, right? That's where you learn to see the world the way God does. And that's going to affect non-moral things, like what you eat and what you don't eat, in this case. It's going to affect moral things. Sex with your wife is good. Sex with anybody else is bad. You're going to learn to see the way God does. But here's the kicker of what the rest of the chapter shows us. First of all, I'll, I'll say this. We'll have to show it next week is that therefore making the law of God a source of wisdom in your life is not just simply knowing the rules. Because Solomon's demonstration that he gets it is not a straightforward, just check the box of which law in Deuteronomy this falls under. You have to learn to understand not just the rules, but the mindset of the rules, what we sometimes refer to as the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. And it's not either or, you need both. Because if you, if you try to keep the letter of law without the spirit of the law, you'll miss some stuff. But by the same token, if you just try to keep the letter of law without the spirit, that's called hypocrisy, and God don't like that. You need both. And so Solomon shows it a deep, subtle way that he doesn't just get, you know, where I can check the box, pull out the rule book like the referees do at a ball game in a, in a really complicated case where we have video review going on. He gets it at a deep, deep, deep level. He's internalized not just the letter of law, but the very mindset that the law reflects so that he can discern good and evil. Who's the real mama of this baby? And all Israel's amazed. All right, see you next week.